Thank you, John, for taking some time to join us in the lion's den. So, we come to our last speaker, uh, who is uh, from Australia, uh, Margaret Thornton, a professor of law at Australian National University. The title of her presentation is, as outlined in the program, The Challenge for Law Schools of Sustaining a Liberal Education in a Marketized Climate. Professor Thornton. to um, the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta on its centenary and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm sorry I have a rather croaky voice as a result of travelling around Canada. Uh, so some of the points that I uh, wish to make will um, already uh, resonate with earlier um, contributions, uh, particularly um, Harry Arthur's um, in terms of the dy dystopian relationship between academia and practice, although I'm going on to um, say a little bit about um, the Australian position, given that we uh, have this, the dubious honour of being somewhat to the fore in terms of the corporatisation of universities. So, first of all, this, this notion of the dystopian relationship, of course, is at least a thousand years old. So I don't think it's something new uh, that we are confronting, except I'm suggesting that it has become more difficult, more acute, and uh, the rift uh, has become deeper as a result of corporatization, despite all the rhetoric about a balance being affected. Uh, but it has remained elusive, and I'm suggesting it is now uh, more uh, elusive. So I'm looking at the uh, Australian um, situation, which I, I think might provide an example, a forecast uh, for you, uh, because of, of the alacrity and passion with which Australia embraced um, corporatisation and marketisation of higher education. And I've written a book about that, uh, Privatising Public University. Um, the case of law, which I looked at um, New Zealand, UK, Canada and Australia. So Canada was a little bit uh, behind in terms of these values uh, when I wrote the book that's published last year, uh, but I think it's cut, catching up now. But just the uh, Australian picture, I think, does sort of uh, make it fairly clear how dramatic this change has been so that there was a period of free higher education, really only lasted a nanosecond, 1973 to 1988, and where the sort of things that um, have already, already been adverted to by Harry Arthur's uh, anti-fundamentalism, Holloway, a gilded age, those sort of things, so the ferment around social reform, the modernization of the legal curriculum and pedagogical reform, innovative, innovative legal scholarship, whereas in the past it hadn't. Legal academics um, were serious researchers or not. Uh, remember, it was the sort of thing they were sort of dilettantes, uh, did something in the, in the vacations. Uh, and so things have rather changed, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about that. And, um, but this move towards creative and imaginative scholarship did um, sort of... Um, a, well, not exact, exactly raise the hackles of the profession, but there were certainly suspicion uh, because the role uh, of law school, after all, was thought to be um, training people for uh, the profession, not going off writing esoteric um, articles on feminist legal theory or whatever. Um, anyway, just that's a very, it's going to be a very brief overview. So we find the, uh, what I've called the neoliberal turn then, so I'm referring always to Australia, but I mean there are certain uh, similarities, particularly New Zealand um, and, and the UK. So we have this uh, shift to a new knowledge economy. So this is something you know, at the state level, but of course uh, was orchestrated in part by the OECD. And it meant that there would be a shift away from a reliance on uh, agriculture, mining and manufacturing to knowledge. And so Leotard 
uh, actually uh, suggested 20 years ago uh, that it was now knowledge, not land, which was the basis of um, dispute um, between uh, nation states. And so actually the idea was then to have more and more students go to, to university. They would be, we would be producing uh, new knowledge workers. So we have this uh, so-called massification of higher education. It's a rather ugly word, but it uh, captures the notion. So 16 new universities emerged in four years. So this occurred from 1988. So we're looking at um, a change uh, over uh, a 25-year trajectory. And so the movement away then from free higher education to a user pays philosophy. Um, but public funding, we're talking about public universities in Australia, uh, was not increased despite these, these, these new institutions. And so that the idea then was user pays, uh, and if there wasn't enough money, it was then up to institutions to generate um, the additional funds themselves. And this, I do suggest, encouraged a significant shift away from interrogation and critique to applied knowledge. Because those who were paying the users, um, they were more interested in the credentialism than in the, than in the content. They didn't want to sit around and philosophise and theorise about legal education. Uh, and so, so a, a significant change occurred um, uh, in, in terms of, um, well, subtly occurred in terms of the curriculum over time. Now, it was um, made relatively easy, easy in political terms because um, the government in, uh, devised uh, an income contingent loan scheme, which students supported, known um, as HECS, or now it's called Fee Help. And what this meant is that students did not have to begin repaying the, lay, the loan until they earned um, a certain specific salary. So if they never reached that salary, they wouldn't have to repay it. If they left the country, they wouldn't have to pay it. There are now billions and billions of dollars owing, so it'll be interesting to see what our new uh, conservative government does with that. It is a matter of concern. However, uh, as a result of the income contingent loan scheme, it meant there was a high degree of um, acceptability uh, on the part of the community and of students so that um, this system was able to be um, uh, um, developed and uh, of course over time uh, fees were ratcheted up as inevitably happens with law at the highest, highest level. And as part of this uh, a neoliberal turn uh, we see the commodification of higher education. So this is a very significant uh, um, uh, change and it was mentioned by one of the speakers this morning, this idea of the shift away uh, from higher education as a public good to higher education as a commodity. And so that the, and, and uh, uh, some people have mentioned um, uh, Canadian students studying law uh, in, in Australia. Um, so there was really a phenomenal uh, increase there uh, with, by, by 2004, there were 24% uh, of all uh, higher education students were international students. And of course, they, they pay at a higher, higher rate. So you can see the notion of, of commodification there. Um, I mentioned Moscow on the Malonglo. This isn't my phrase, but I think it's rather a nice phrase. Um, now, you may not, never have heard of the Malonglo because it's the river in Canberra. It's a very small river. Uh, which runs into Lake Burley Griffin. And Moscow, of course, suggests the notion of the, of the Kremlin. And um, an, an economist wrote a piece called Moscow and the Malonglo um, to describe the extreme degree of bureaucratization that we find uh, in Australia higher education. And I think this, this is an important um, dimension here and, and maybe uh, just something that distinguishes uh, Australia from uh, from Canada, although we do see some of that in the, in the UK and New Zealand um, uh, as, as well. And, uh, well, just the, the case of law then, um, the number of law schools increased dramatically 
Uh, so, and this is a, a in distinct contrast to Canada, uh, where the numbers have, have remained stable until quite recently. So, we moved in the 25 years from 1988, 1989, uh, from 12 to 36. 36. There's 36. There's about to, about to begin. Um, and also, the number of, of uh, law students overall increased exponentially because traditional law schools also um, increased their intakes. So there was pressure um, everywhere um, on the part of universities, um, the new ones and the old ones, to offer law because it was seen to be cheap to offer. All you needed, was a, a few, all you needed were a few lecturers, a few old law books and a piece of chalk now replaced by PowerPoint, of course. Um, and so this was seen to be desirable because law would then be able to help underwrite the more expensive parts of the university, the um, particularly techno sciences. Um, admission requirements, um, well, we've been talking about that in the last session. Um, so there is a notion of a, a core, the Priestly 11. Notice that has two E's. One of the papers I read had only one, which has a rather different meaning altogether. Uh, Priestly is actually named after a former judge who chaired the committee. And so the, these are the, uh, the formal requirements uh, that are set down um, uh, uh, 11 um, uh, subjects or areas of knowledge, plus competency, competency standards. Um, or skills, uh, and as, as a result of the large proportion of the curriculum that's taken up, uh, there is in fact less scope for crit critique, um, I'm suggesting. Also, we see um, cheaper forms of pedagogy um, uh, introduced, or really a reversion to older forms of pedagogy, such as lectures, rather than the small group interaction and discussion in the uh, tutorials that uh, Ian mentioned. <laughs> um, sometimes they've disappeared or they've become much larger. Small group teaching was just too expensive as the numbers increased and increased. So uh, my own university, there are more than 400 first year students. It just became too expensive to have um, you know, groups of, of um, 12 for every class. And of course, um, the online uh, move has become uh, pronounced. Uh, and the ANU refers to that uh, rather neatly, I think, as digital capture. So there has to be digital capture of all lectures um, in order to satisfy the student customers. So it, it's in terms of flexibility, so if they're unable to come to class because they're working or whatever, uh, the classes will be uh, available for them. And of course, that is the imperative that is becoming more pronounced um, as it is everywhere else. Uh, assessment too, we see the, the impact uh, in terms of cheaper forms, a move away from uh, long research essays because um, they take too long to mark and uh, the students complain they take too long to do. Uh, and just briefly on the transformation of the, of the legal profession, um, which we've mentioned a little bit today, but Australia again was to the fore in some of these uh, measures because in um, 1993 uh, competition policy officially became part of the Australian government policy and was accepted um, uh, by, the, by the legal profession. And so the sort of things that have been mentioned, specialist providers, um, ha what hasn't been mentioned are things like incorporation of law firms, so making law firms more like business, businesses, so moving away from partnerships. And uh, perhaps um, most dramatic of all uh, was in 2007 when Slater and Gordon was listed on, on the stock exchange. That was the first firm in the, in the world to actually do that. Um, uh, and so that's, that's an extraordinary thing in terms of the nature of change uh, of what legal practice uh, actually means. And uh, you can see the focus upon. Um, profit making uh, is important. Similarly, globalisation of firms. So almost all the top firms in Australia um, have now uh, merged or amalgamated or formed some other sort of relationship uh, with 
um, leading global firms, particularly the Magic Circle f firms uh, in London, but also some in Canada and, and, and the US. Um, and so again, I think that's changed the whole basis of professionalism and service. And of course, things we've mentioned of, of outsourcing, offshoring, automation, um, etc. Um, so I wanted to just highlight the dichotomy in terms of research and teaching um, and the way that research has become privileged o over teaching and uh, the way that research as part of the new knowledge economy is actually contradicts, I think, um, the dimension of the production of new knowledge workers through teaching. So with research, one is supposed to engage in, in knowledge transfer and commercialization. Now that again applies particularly to techno-science. Uh, law is not so good at being able to commercialize its research. Uh, but nevertheless, there is enormous pressure uh, to do this. And um, I spoke a couple of days ago at Osgood Hall about the construction of the ideal academic. The academic is a technopreneur, um, but I won't pursue that. So we have to have world-class scholarship, has to be innovative and creative, um, but it conflicts, I'm suggesting, with the applied practice-ready knowledge, orthodox or, or known knowledge. And we, we find the emphasis, again, um, is um, exacerbated in terms of the research audits, which you don't have in, in Canada or, or the US, which is interesting, but, uh, you know, is a pronounced dimension um, of academic life in Australia, New Zealand, um, UK and elsewhere. So the ERA is Excellence in Research for Australia, the REF is the new UK one. So here we have the state bureaucratized system designed to encourage uh, and measure quality and excellence through research. There has to be accountability in terms of the public funding of research. And it, and it means an emphasis for individuals on performativity and productivity and the favouring of international stars who are going to move, move around, preferably those who win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and this feeds into the notion of league tables and rankings, which uh, someone did actually mention. So one has to be ranked as being world class and above. Uh, you know, there are these extraordinary um, sort of indicators associated uh, with each level. And this encourages then a greater focus on research at the expense of teaching. So fellowship, fellowships are encouraged uh, that might buy out teaching, which is, encourages the casualization of teaching, contract uh, teaching, and again it has a, has a gendered uh, effect. And it means that the, the, the number of hours expended on teaching is re uh, reduced, and there are shortcuts such as offering intensives, block teaching, whatever you might call them, uh, you know, offering a course in a couple of weekends, master's courses and so on, um, uh, don't have much depth, or, or offering them online and quick and easy uh, assessment tasks. So the proliferation of law schools in Australia, um, I think, has not uh, produced other than minimal diversity. Even though they have this, this large number, of course there are economic differences and regional differences, but there hasn't really been uh, a distinctive modus operandi uh, associated with particular um, uh, law schools. And that's because, I'm suggesting, um, of these um, um, demands from the various uh, bureaucracies, from the, uh, from the profession in terms of the, the state, in terms of the institution and so on, the regulatory role then exercises a homogenizing uh, effect. And, but nevertheless, um, it's worth noting that um, more than 50% of our students actually do not enter the profession. And I think that that's important to note. So that's not recognized in terms of, of the diversity. They go in, you know, into public uh, sector or uh, um, uh, community sector or international organizations or, or um, in, into business. Now, uh, uh, it's interesting to note that the Ontario Higher Education Quality Council 
supports differentiation amongst un universities, but it doesn't actually make reference to disciplines. And it seems to me the debate on curricular diversity in legal education is something that is, that is absent. So concluding then, I'm suggesting, and it sounds a bit like uh, sort of harking uh, for the past, that a liberal le legal education is the only way to prepare law students adequately for a, a diverse range of destinations, including legal practice. It's more likely to accommodate the, the dramatic ch uh, pace of change in legal practice and university cultures that we've heard about. Um, it allows space for interrogation and critique. It allows reflexivity uh, in legal practice. Uh, and I think that it would mean that students were less disillusioned on graduation and say, you know, the, the literature that's been coming out of the, of the US more uh, recently uh, suggests. And it might go some way towards addressing, if not bridging the gap between legal scholarship and the teaching of law. Thank you.